Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 21 of the Argument Clinic. My name is Martin Sigalo, and I'm joined by my lovely pod host, Lawrence. Lawrence, what's your last name? Uh, Zoe, although people pronounce it Zhao or Zhu or any variety of different Asian-ish sounding last names. Ah, so if I just like was surprised by something and I was like, oh, but then I was just like, Zoe, like on accident, like that's your name. Wait, I've actually never heard someone describe it like that. That might actually be how I tell people to pronounce my last name from now on. Wow, I'm so helpful. I'm so important. I'm so important. Um, well, anyway, welcome everyone to the Argument Clinic. This is a podcast about the fundamentals of Lincoln-Douglas debate. Whether you're a grizzled veteran of the tournament scene, a novice going to their second or third tournament, a coach who wants to improve teaching Lincoln-Douglas debate to their kids, uh, or any other kind of debate, or just someone who wants to have a good old time chuckling it up with uh, with Martin and Lawrence. This is the podcast for you. We have another special mystery guest that you all know the name of by now because you looked at the episode description, but who we will reveal uh, shortly. But in the meantime, so Lawrence, where have you been since our last episode on efficiency? Where have you been throughout the world? Ancient Egypt, perhaps? Ancient uh -huh. Greece? No, I went well? to the. Uh, I, I for some reason decided to take a trip up to the Columbia tournament, where I actually judged the final round of the tournament with our mystery guest. Um, and then last weekend, I was in. Did Dallas you squirrel? Did you squirrel? I did. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been on top in a finals decision, but I don't think you I've were ever on the made bottom it correct. Of the one, dude. Okay, like let's not bring up bad times. Um, <laughs> Oh, oh wait, no, no, no. I in finals of Grapevine this year, I was on top and I made the right decision. Uh, but other than that, I don't I literally don't think I've ever made the correct decision in finals. I don't think I've been in the I don't think I've been on a finals panel in a long time. I haven't been in a finals panel this year because uh, uh, my kids are in the finals. <laughs> so, yeah, humble brag. Um, but it's it's not even a humble brag. It's just a straight up brag. Anyway, uh, I went to some random uh, local tournament. I think we went to a CFL where our HI person who had just won the Sun Invitational in GMU uh, didn't place, um, and then just got fourth at Emory. So, and then I went to Emory, one of my favorite tournaments. I have a love hate relationship with the Emory tournament um, throughout throughout the years. Put in put in a lot of work. Kids did pretty well. Uh, I'm overall happy with the result, and we did and we did better in some other events. And overall, it was just it was just a general, a general, general, general good time. Um, unfortunately, Lawrence Lawrence was not there because uh, because of his indiscretions. Um, he 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 wasn't not there for any particular reason. I just like saying, Lawrence, are you discreet or are you indiscreet? Uh, neither. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, all right. So before we waste too much more of your time, I want to give a shout out to Victory Briefs. They are the sponsor of our podcast. Um, Victory Briefs is one of the premier debate camps throughout the throughout the United States, and I highly recommend signing up. Their sessions are live now and will be in the episode descriptions. Um, it truly is a great debate camp with tons of excellent instructors. And uh, Lawrence, you'll be working there, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, okay. Um, I will not be working there, unfortunately. Okay, so on to the main topic of this week. So this um, is a scholarship episode. During this episode, we're going to we're going to teach you all some very important debate concepts. Now, this is a scholarship episode on strategy. We're just got, we're going to do an intro to strategy. What is strategy? How does it work? And then we're going to give the basic, the very basic outline of strategy. Um, which is a concept called offense and defense. And the goal of our episode is to try and get uh, is to try and get as good as possible into those concepts really in depth. And once you all understand those concepts, then a, a new world of debate um, will will open up to you. Even if you think you understand some of these concepts, it may be important to listen to confirm that in fact you do. We also have a special guest, as I, as I alluded to earlier, who we will introduce in the first body segment of our podcast. Uh, any last words, Lawrence, before I, uh, you know, cast off into the dark and stormy night of this episode? Uh, I'm excited for this one because this is one that I wanted to do like a year ago, and now we're finally getting to it. 
yes, I, uh, I, I specifically, Lauren suggested that we do it really early, and I say no, our our people need need some time to ruminate on stuff that we tell them before we do this. But you're finally ready. Um, all right. So when we get back, we will discuss what is strategy. Then we'll talk about what's offense and defense, and then we'll talk about practical, practically identifying offense and defense. But when we come back, our mystery guest and strategy. The first important thing that we have to discuss is what is strategy. But before that, I'd like to welcome our special guest, Zoe Ewing. How are you, Zoe? Good. How are you? I'm doing just tremendous. Tremendous. I'm doing tremendously. I'm also doing tremendous. Would doing tremendous be like if you were like tremendous, like overall in your personality? Like is, is that or like your actions just are have the property of being tremendous? Is that what that means, Zoe? I'm honestly not sure. I like grammar a lot, but I don't think I know enough to answer that question. Mm, important. Um, so you debated for Scarsdale High School, right? I did. If you had to sum up your your achievements in a nice in a nice and easy way, or sorry, never mind, that's stupid. Just pick your like funnest achievement, your like funnest fact about debate achievement thing. Ooh. Um Biggest fun fact would be that I was top seed at the NCFLs because I did not expect to be, and every panel was three parent judges, and I was I managed to get all fifteen parents who judged me in prelims to vote for me. So that was wow. just a fun and unexpected achievement. Wow, that's tremendous! I certainly have did not do that during the times that I went to the CFL national tournament. <laughs> Um, any of you who have the opportunity, by the way, to attend CFL Nationals should, if only because it's just an absolutely bananas tournament. Like, it's just nuts. Like It's it really just, is. There are a lot of ceremonies. Yeah, lots of ceremonies. All your rounds are bizarre. It's just, um, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's really fun. Uh, I've told a lot of, uh, stories about, um, CFL Nationals on, on, on this podcast before. So hopefully we can, we can get some more. So CFL national, nationally recognized, uh, top seed person, Zoe Ewing, um, <laughs> here, here with us. Um, Lawrence, how'd you do at CFL Nationals? I have never gone despite the fact that, well, the only type of debate I did was traditional debate. So sad. You attended the NSDA Nationals tournament. If you had to average your the, pra- the place you got your senior and junior year, what would it be? What would what's your average place between those two years? Uh, so sixth my junior year, first senior year. So what is that like? One plus six divided by two, so three point five. Three point five. That's almost as good as me, where I went five seven in prelims and didn't break. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> uh, but I did is break it. it I, did, I did break it the CFL national tournament. Um, and a truly, I had a truly Kafka esque experience in that round, which I'm sure that I've talked about on the podcast before. But if it if it helps, though, I worked out that I won nationals my senior year with only five or maybe four more ballots than the minimum amount possible to win the entire tournament. So, like, assume just like only splits uh, and like the minimum amount of prelim ballots and stuff to get like only four more than the minimum. So, yeah. That, that's always nice to know. That, that's probably interesting to at least one of us. Um, Just me. All right. Okay. All right. Um, into the final subject matter of our podcast, strategy. So first, this section, we're going to talk about what is strategy generally, what sort of things are strategic, um, and why should you be thinking about strategy uh, at all? So um, first question, though, what is strategy? Lawrence, do you want to discuss what strategy is with us? So according to Google, the most reputable of all uh, sites, strategy is a plan of action designed to achieve uh, a major uh, goal or aim. Uh, so Zoe, if you, had to, if you had to choose a goal or aim from your participation in a debate round, um, what, what, what would it be? What are, what are you looking for? Is it just like, are you just looking to see how many lemur references you can include in your speech? Like, is that the goal or, uh, maybe something else? Yeah. You know, I think the goal, although maybe sometimes it would be funny references, is usually winning. Winning. Yes. And what does it mean, uh, Lawrence at a very basic level, what does it mean to win a debate? 
It means to persuade some judge to sign the ballot for you, designating you as the winner. Uh, yeah, I, I really like that sort of minimalist account, and I think people sometimes overcomplicate um, this thing. All, the only thing that you have to do to win is that the judge writes your name on the ballot. And uh, if they don't do that, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say, but you really don't win. Um, there's really nothing else. And of course, the whole point of debate is to, is to try and, and get them to write your name on that sheet of paper uh, as much as much as much as possible. And the more people write your name on that piece of paper, uh, the better you will do in tournaments. So strategy is a plan of action designed to achieve a major aim. And that major aim is winning. So a plan of action, uh, I'm going to leave out or policy. So a plan of action designed to get you to win. So um, what what do you, so Zoe, um, what do you think it means by a plan of action? How is it distinct from just like debating normally and winning? Yeah. So I think that the main thing that would make it a plan of action would be the idea that you're looking ahead to what your opponent might say after your speech and what your last speech is going to look like. Because usually in your last speech, that's when you give your main reasons why the judge should vote for you. So you need to be sure that you have good reasons at the end of the round. So the idea is you want to formulate every speech looking toward that last speech and the reasons why the judge will ultimately sign the ballot for you. Yeah, I love that. It's, an, it's a plan of action and it looks ahead to the end of the debate. It's not like you're like you're acting randomly, you know. Now, Lawrence, you you've judged a lot of times, and um, I, I can't even overstate how much I've judged. I, I worked out when I was bored in class that judging only national circuit rounds, not including camp or local rounds, I've judged nearly fifteen straight days worth of debates. I can't believe that you know that. Yeah, I can't believe that either. Uh, <laughs> that wow. Incredible is a word that you could use, which has multiple meanings, and both those would encompass you knowing that. Um, so, so you've judged a lot of rounds, and uh, you've seen a lot of debates. Now, uh, if you had to assign a percentage, well, if you had to assign a percentage of debates that had people, quote unquote, acting strategically, what percentage would that be? And, like by maybe. Act, and by acting strategically, I don't mean making the right decision all the time, but I mean making decisions. Um, well, maybe like 70, 80 percent of, of debates. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Like, do you mean like good decisions? Because if we're talking good decisions, no. that goes down. Uh, and if we're talking just like decisions, then yeah, probably around there. Because I'd say like a good one out of five debates that I judge contain people that don't really have a vision of how the debate plays out. So, so basically, basically here, here's um, here's kind of the analogy that that I want to draw. So most of the time when people discuss strategy, they do so in terms of games. You might imagine a game like. Monopoly or chess or checkers or something like that. Games have various levels of complexity, but the goal of the game is always to win. And in the game, you should have a plan uh, when when you're playing it. But also, it is possible to play games without a strategy. And sometimes you see that all the time. And it would kind of be if someone plays, if you were playing a game of chess with maybe someone very young. Let's say that they knew the rules, but they didn't really know why you would make any particular play. So they kind of just make plays that seem like appealing to them at the time. And then they like do things that like look cool. And then at the end of the game, they figure out whether they won. So, th so those people are not acting strategically because they kind of don't have a sense of what any individual thing that they do adds up to them doing well. So... I've seen a lot of debates, even really fast debates, where people seem to not really know why they're making arguments. Now, Zoe, would you would you would you think that would you agree with me that this like appears a lot in like second year debaters? Yeah, I think a lot of the time people have 
you know, they have the idea of a case down, they have the idea of, you know, maybe certain types of arguments that are popular on the circuit, but they might be less likely to know how to use them in terms of interacting with the other arguments in the round and instead will just extend as much as they can and, and respond as much as they can to their opponent's arguments without thinking about which specific issues in the round they really need to go for. Right, and that kind of goes into a lot of different issues that we'll sort of talk about talk about eventually. But I do, I definitely agree with the, with your overall point, which is a lot of people kind of when when they get the mechanics of debate, they kind of they're not looking at things in like a bigger picture sense, you know. So, um, so in any game, um, because because debate is a game, you have strategy in the game. Now, in games, you make moves. Now, Lawrence, if I had to say, what what does it mean to make a move, quote unquote, in a debate? Um, so, you know, for some reason, I've gotten really into to watching chess videos online recently, and so you know, My watching. Um, sorry, they're they're really interesting. Uh, and so watching these people like these masters who are far beyond my comprehension play, make moves and, you know, sort of strategize ways that they can accomplish goals at, uh, you know, both micro level goals in chess. So for example, capturing this particular piece or maintaining a certain position versus, you know, the macro level goal, which is ultimately just to win or checkmate the King. I like to see that in, in debates as well. And so when we're making moves in debates, there's sort of micro level, uh, sort of moves that you make in debates, which is to maybe win this argument or to disprove this piece of evidence. Um, and then there's sort of macro level moves, which are just, you know, win the debate sort of, right? Make a position, win that position sort of thing. And so, so, so I agree with you, but I, I also kind of want us to broaden uh, the definition of move a little bit. So, so here's a question. So let's, so, um, so if you want to make a move, in debate, making moves is really like making decisions, right? A decision right. is a move. You decide to do something as opposed to something else. That counts as a move, right? Right, yeah. And if you wanted to make a decision about what something to do as opposed to, to something else, kind of relative to your speech, how does that work? Like what, like what do you have to do with your speech to make a move in it? Um, well, in, you have to decide how much. I, I, I guess if your question is like, is sort of geared towards the time aspect of debate, which is that you have to decide how much time you would allocate to an argument uh, that you're going to make versus the strength of that argument and the value of that argument versus the time invested in it versus any other argument you could have invested that time in as well. Yeah, um, that is what, what I was going for. General idea being that you make moves in debate by making decisions about where to spend your time and kind of what to do with it. Because right. all you have, because... One important thing that I, I want you all to realize is that um, the only thing that you can do in a debate is make decisions about how to spend your time. That is your resource. You can speak and you have time and that's it. Those are, that's the fundamental currency of debate. And if you understand, if you get anything from this discussion of strategy, it's that you make decisions about how to spend your time. That's what strategy is. Of course, you want to win the debate, and that should be the overall goal of the moves that you make. But you make moves by spending time in certain ways. So um, you kind of have to map out your time in advance. Now, I want to just, Zoe, I want to talk about, about something strategically. So it's kind of easy to think about strategy just in terms of arguments. But... Can you maybe go through some non-argument kinds of strategies? Like if you wanted to spend your time doing something else that might increase your, your chance of winning, like how would you do that? Hmm, okay, so I think that one thing that you can do is slowing down and explaining very specifically to the judge what their main, like what the main issues in the round are. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily making arguments. You've usually already made those arguments earlier in the speech. But the idea of like crystallization is still a strategic move because you're using your time to decide to like appeal to the judge directly instead of making new arguments or adding like a fifth response to a contention or something. Yeah, you know, exactly right. Great example. So 
you use your time, you say, I'd like to use my time. I think it will best increase my chance of winning if I just like really slow down and like explain an argument, you know? Yeah. It's, it's not enough to just like say some stuff about make an additional fifth argument that doesn't do anything for you. So this kind of leads into our next, our next discussion um, about strategy, which is Lawrence, how do you know whether something is not strategic? If you kind of had to, if you, if you had to like look at a, a series, a section of time that someone spends doing something or like a move that they make. So how would you know in debate whether that's unstrategic? Uh, it's a little bit difficult for me to answer that question in a vacuum, but it's sort of a question of the time that you invested doing certain practice X versus the time uh, versus the return that you could get if you had uh, invested that time into another practice Y. So maybe you spend 30 seconds uh, trying to disprove a single piece of evidence in the affirmative case, and the affirmative doesn't even attempt to extend that piece of evidence in the next speech, um, and you still spend another 30 minutes in your 2 and R uh, answering that evidence again. And that seems very unstrategic because you have allocated a minute of time uh, out of 13 minutes of speech time to disproving something that is no longer relevant in the debate because the affirmative has not gone for it. Um, and so if that time had been allocated towards something else, like maybe perhaps disproving the affirmative value criterion, that would be more strategic because that same amount of time could have given you so much more mileage in the debate. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree with exactly what you said, which leads into a question that I'd, I'd like to ask you, Zoe. What is the strategic value of a four-second argument? Well, I guess the strategic value of it really depends on how long it then takes your opponent to respond to it. So a four-second argument is not strategic if your opponent can spend zero seconds responding to it and it has no consequence on the round. So if it's something <laughs> just completely yeah. silly or has no impact or no warrant, things like that. But a four second argument could have strategy if it took a very long time for your opponent to respond to. So that's another important thing, which is that strategy is also interactive. The, the, the game of debate would be much more boring if you didn't have an opponent. If your opponent was just like yeah. some computer that spit stuff at you, you know, you have a real opponent and they make choices in response to your choices. Yeah. So it could be that a four sentence argument is strategic. Um, because, because, it debaters feel like they have to answer it, you know, that yeah. could be the, the strategic value of it. But just, you know, imagine in the abstract of, of your opponent, let's say that like you, you don't have an opponent and you want to figure out like how useful is a four second argument, assuming that like the opponent will, will, you know, not answer it. One of the things that I thought you said that was, that was really good was like, you know, it could also be that they need to spend zero seconds responding to it because your four second argument wasn't complete because it was four seconds. Yeah, and I think that's usually the case. I mean, like four seconds is really no amount of time that's ever significant. Um, mm -hmm. If you think yeah. about like, if you think about in any round, probably 99, over 99% of rounds would never be decided on a four second argument. And Oftentimes, you know, your judge won't even catch it. Your opponent might not catch it, which could be good. But if your judge doesn't catch it, then it definitely doesn't matter. So right. the idea that you'd be able to fix a claim, warrant, and impact in a four-second argument is just very small. Yeah, I'm pretty sure when I was a sophomore, I only made four-second arguments, which uh, contributed to my atrocious win rate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've certainly made four-second arguments and probably won on them an embarrassing number of times, but I think that in general, they're not strategic when you think about like overall how confident a judge has to be in your arguments to vote for them. You know, you're limiting yourself to a very small percentage of the judge pool once you're reliant on those types of arguments. Exactly, you know, and so so basically, even though an argument might, might look nice, if it's too short, if it doesn't have a claim or a warrant or an impact or something, uh, it would be it would be quite something for something to not have a claim, but um, yeah. if it if it lacked a impact or warrant, then it's just not strategic because it doesn't have any benefit. Because a lot of the time, as you say, they won't they won't catch it. So who cares? It doesn't matter. So, uh, so as Lauren said, it's all about a bang for your buck. 
you want your points to do something. You want to spend time in certain places and you want that time to do something. And that thing affects you at the end of the debate. That's 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 kind of like it. If you want to look at things strategically, you kind of have to map it out. So you you would see for example in various other sports ball sorts of things like football for example i know that people have these like big charts with all these plays that you can do and this person goes here and this person goes here and and this person goes here and so the important thing also from a strategy point of view is that you kind of are looking at it from the top down you know you aren't just looking at the one decision that you make in isolation from all your other decisions you're kind of looking ahead to see how your decisions affect each other. Um, okay, uh, Zoe, uh, is strategy easy? No, I don't think it is easy. I think that it's easy to enter into. So the transition to starting to think strategically is something that's more about mindset and listening to rounds and just understanding more how arguments interact with one another. But I think it's a very the bar is very high. It's a very high ceiling, I guess is what I want to say, because there are debaters that just keep getting more and more strategic. And I don't think it's something that's ever really capped, um, whereas something mm -hmm. like technical proficiency definitely can be capped. So I think it is definitely something that you can start doing, but to get better at it takes a lot of work and practice. Yeah, um, all of that, all of that definitely true uh strategy is hard it's easy to get into no one completely masters it here's a different question for you zoe um i'm just i'm just curious about what what your thoughts are about this do you think that as many people would do ld if you could master it you could master strategy oh that's interesting i don't think they I, would because i think it would get boring um yeah, i 100 percent agree and i think the debaters who get close to mastering it probably get pretty bored with it um, like, I don't know. I never, I never felt like I mastered it. I think that a lot of debaters think that they can just, there's still things that you always look back after the round and realize that you missed or, you know, realizing that even though you won the round, you could have won the round in the first minute of the two NR or something like that. Um, there's never, I don't think that, I think that's what keeps debate fun and exciting. Um, the idea that like, you can always get better at strategy and there are always more elements to the round that have been like unexplored. I definitely agree. Lawrence, did you ever get better at strategy? Um, I, I'd like to think so. Like, ah. I, I don't think freshman year me knew what strategy was. I'm, I'm inclined to think that even junior year me didn't really know what strategy was. And I still don't really know, to be honest. Mm, I definitely acted mostly randomly my first couple years. I, I, I do remember some random experiences in my novice year where I like where i acted surprisingly strategically like i like like i remember like there was this one round where i was like judge this is the key dispute and then i like you know i isolated it and then i like only talked about that one thing part of me wonders whether i accidentally did issue selection on the basis of tunnel vision does, does that make sense like so like so many of, of of our novices are just thinking about so many different things but i think novice martin was just like i want to only think about one thing thing at any given time. So I'll just talk about that for like the whole time. And then that just ended up working out in front of lay judges. <laughs> like I, I, me I remember this, the, this one round at Nava State where I was just getting destroyed. And then I noticed my opponent had dropped this like one random blip that I had made. And then I just like talk, I was like, well, the only way I can win is if I talk about this for like four minutes in front of this panel of lay judges. And then uh, I won and my opponent was really salty. So, and then your opponent grew on to be a sitting senator of the United States of America. Oh, God. I actually have no clue where he is right now. He's, I, I don't remember his name. <laughs> I remember his name was Alex and he went to Trinity Prep. I have no idea where he is right now. What if he just like is like in politics or something? Uh, probably not. Um, uh, okay. So that's, so, so that's, uh, that's what we have for what is strategy. When we get back, we're going to talk about offense and defense in the context of strategy. Offense and defense, the main strategy discussion for this podcast. So um, 
the key distinction between offense and defense, Lawrence, what does offense and defense mean in other games? If you had to discuss what is, what does offense look like, for example, in football? Yeah. So I guess it makes sense to first talk about other sports and then draw an analogy back to debate and some of the misconceptions surrounding offense and defense. So we'll start with sports. Uh, I played, believe it or not, uh, basketball or, eh, no, I, I play basketball. I, I, I played basketball for a while. And uh, offense in basketball is, you know, just attempting to score on the other team. So when you, you know, make a layup, dunk it, shoot a three pointer, whatever, anything that gets the points on your uh, for your scoreboard to go up. Um, and defense in basketball is preventing the other team from scoring against you, pr- making sure that their points uh, do not go up. So that's basically all it is. Offense is uh, attacking uh, and then defense is just pr- defending. Okay, now this is a very difficult concept, I think, for a lot of people to understand. And one of the reasons that we're giving a discussion on offense and defense while we're doing a whole podcast on it is because I think that this is the most often concept where you teach to someone, they say, yeah, yeah, I get it, and then they don't. Yeah. Because, you know, we you would, like, ask them about it. And so we're going to do a section later where we kind of go through things in specific examples. But I think what offense and defense means is not – is not necessarily um, obvious. So um, offense in a game of basketball, you know, scoring baskets is offense. Um, and I guess just one one question for you, Lawrence, why is that? Uh, what do you mean? So why, why is scoring baskets uh, offense? Oh, because it gets you points, and the winner of the basketball game is the one with more points than the other team. Right. So, so the idea is it's directly tied to the win condition of the game, right? The win condition of the game in basketball is you have more points, right? Yep. I mean, win condition, what a fancy word, but yeah. Yes. Sorry. I I play a lot of random trading card games and we use the term win condition a lot. And I think that it's helpful. So the win condition of the game there, there are maybe multiple, but in basketball, it's pretty much just one. If you have more points than them, you win. Yep. And so, you know, one of and the ways that you win is by scoring points in uh in 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 basketball. Now, in debate, I just want us to get at a very a very important concept, which is in debate, not all arguments logically mean that you win. Right. So, um so Zoe question I I would have for you is in debate in a sort of normal traditional debate where you know one side affirms the resolution and one side negates the resolution um what arguments are offense let's say for the affirmative in in a given debate if I looked at an argument and I wanted to figure out whether it's offense you know that means that winning it is somehow related to the win condition of the round so if I'm the affirmative, I guess my question is, what is the win condition uh, if you're affirmative? Yeah, so I think that largely it would be either the affirmative's contentions. So, you know, contention one, contention two um, would each be a separate piece of offense. And then if the affirmative were to make turns on the NC, um, so reasons why under the NC's framework, you would still affirm. Those would both be the, I guess, the two main categories of offense in a traditional round. Yes. So I agree that those are the, that those are our characteristics of offense. I do want to ask you a slightly different but related question, which is basically why are those offense? And um, what I what I kind of want us to discuss is in the context of the win conditions for the debate. Why are both of those things offense? What important thing do they do that makes them offense? Yeah, so I guess if you think about it in terms of like a sliding scale where right now the resolution is like completely neutral um, and that's how it starts out, the affirmative would attempt to sort of move that balance to the, the resolution being proactively good with their contentions. They're all reasons why we should do the resolution and that would be a good thing to do. And then reasons why the not doing the resolution would be bad would be turns to the NC and reasons why not doing the resolution would be bad would also mean then that doing the resolution would be good. So they sort of shift the balance over, I guess, and 
score points for the affirmative because it moves it away from being a neutral question. Exactly. You know, uh, both contention arguments and turns help to prove that your side of the resolution is right. Exactly. Right? And, um, and, you know, the sliding scale is a very good way of thinking about it because you kind of are scoring points in that direction. And the idea is that they prove that your side of the resolution is, is accurate. And when you're negative, obviously, you want to do the opposite. Your contentions and your turns prove that the resolution is wrong on balance, let's say. So, so yeah, um, I think it's, it's really, really, really important that we understand this. That the general distinction between offense and defense is that offensive arguments are reasons to vote for you. And a reason to vote for you is, in the case of the affirmative, that you've proven that your side of the resolution is more accurate than not. And, you know, the same thing if you're negative. If you're negative, you win if you prove that the resolution is wrong. And I think it's very easy to think that things that are not those are somehow offense, but they're not. And that's kind of the key, the really, really important thing. So, so Lawrence, um, you've talked about offense. What is defense? Uh, so defense, if we were going to characterize offense as reasons to vote for me, or if you're affirmative reasons for why the resolution, why we ought do the object of the resolution. And if we're negative as reasons why we ought not do the resolution, then defense is preventing, uh, defense is not voting against me, perhaps. So offenses vote for me, defenses don't vote against me. Um, and typically it's used as a counter to your opponent's offense. So when they say something like, if you're affirmative and the negative provides a reason for why we ought not do the resolution, well, defense would be responding to that person's argument and explaining why it does not prove, in fact, why we ought not to do the resolution. Right. So ex exactly. Basically, if, if you are trying to score points with your arguments, let's say, then defense would be your opponent trying to, you know, knock the ball out of your hand. You tried to make an argument to score a point, and they took out your argument. They slapped, you know, the ball out of your hand. And as a consequence, you tried to do this thing that would help you win, and they stopped you. So defense is when, when you try and prevent your opponent from achieving their win conditions, or when they try to prevent you from doing that. Now, all debates have kind of a different balances of, of offense and defense. Um, so, I, you know, this, this is a, a sort of a brutally simple question. But, Zoe, um, if you had to pick one of these two things to have, you're like, hmm, I can either have offense or I can have defense. Which one would you want? I'd pick offense. Oh, good. Why? <laughs> okay. So, I think I'd pick offense because largely I'm going back to the sliding scale metaphor, but like, any defense is just shifting the pointer like more toward the center. So it's saying, oh, the resolution is just more neutral. Their points don't matter. So a round that was all defense would just end up with the resolution in the middle because you just have reasons not to do either thing. But a round that has lots of offense, um, you'd have a chance of actually winning the round because at least there are reasons to vote for you. Yeah, I mean, when you're debating, you're not trying to get a tie, right? Exactly. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, there's no such thing as a tie also. So that's a problem with the get a tie strategy. But yeah. um, in like the context of a sports analogy, it'd be like it'd be like your favorite basketball team, like only playing defense. It's just like the best you could possibly hope for is like zero zero game. Which is <laughs> hardly, hardly, hardly an entertaining game to watch. Uh, yes. So, um, so I want, I want to talk about, um, so let's go over the kinds of offense that you can have, and then we'll go over why it's really important that we understand this difference between, between offense and defense. So the kinds of offense, Zoe, you, you already mentioned them. So contention offense is, is one of them. And I think that we all know what those are, hopefully. 
And contention arguments, um, well, I, I guess you could theoretically put an argument in your contention that's not offense, you know, because all the, the word contention is, is just, is just that you said the word contention and then made an argument. So theoretically, you could load up your contention with all sorts of defense, and I, I certainly seen seen people do that. But generally, a contention argument is just an argument that you put in your contention that supports your side of the resolution and proves that you should do it or not do it. Um, really quickly, we can talk about these two different kinds of turns. Lawrence, I don't think that we've gone over these on the podcast before, right? Nope. Uh, okay, so in that case, um, in that case, uh, Lawrence, what is a – so there, there are two kinds of turns. The first one is called a link turn, and the second is called an impact turn. Lawrence, in the simplest way possible, what is a link turn? Yeah, so a link turn is when the opposing team claims that the opposite of what was originally claimed to happen uh, occurs. So take, for example, we have a typical argument that is composed of two parts. Uh, so the topic is plea bargaining. So the topic is, or the negative argument is that the affirmative clogs the courts and that is bad. Well, the link to that or how the affirmative changes something is that the affirmative causes court clog um, or clogs the courts. And so the link turn would be to claim that the opposite happens. So instead of the affirmative clogging the courts, the affirmative would turn this argument and turn the link by saying it in fact reduces court clog. So the opposite of what was originally claimed to happen actually happens. Okay, so I, that's obviously right, but I do think it's really important that we differentiate um, two different kinds of very similar sounding claims um one of which is a is a link turn and one of which uh is not so lawrence i could imagine someone that just listened to what to what we said just there and someone would would could think the following so oh a link turn i need to prove that what my opponent says is true the opposite of that is true so if i so if if my opponent says that plea bargaining causes court clog then I need to prove the opposite, which is that plea bargaining does not cause court clock. Ah, yes, of course. Um, and that is, of course, the mistake. Um, so if we refer back to the sliding scale, uh, that model that Zoe presented earlier, if, for example, the negative has attempted to tilt the scale in favor of it saying the affirmative causes court clog, and all you do is attempt to revert that scale back to its original balance point and say that the affirmative does not cause court clog, well, that wouldn't be offense. That would be defense uh, using the sliding scale. So in order to prove the opposite, it's not just that X thing doesn't happen. It's that the other complete opposite on the other side of the scale happens. So instead of the affirmative merely not causing court clog, the affirmative, in fact, alleviates that. And so we've now moved the balance of the scale towards the affirmative. Yes, and this is this is just a really important concept to understand, and I just know because I've talked to a lot of debaters, and I've taught this to a lot of debaters, and it is a very confusing concept to understand at first. But the general idea is it's helpful to think of debate arguments in terms of cause and effect. So someone says that doing the resolution or not doing the resolution causes something. This is what we normally refer to as a link. You could think of it that way. So, so instead of saying, you know, causes court clog, maybe let's just spell out what that means. You could say that um, plea bargaining increases the inefficiency of the court system. So a turn to that would be that plea bargaining makes the court system more efficient because the thing that they care about in that argument is efficiency. Their argument is abolishing plea bargaining de decreases efficiency. You know, think of it like a big down arrow. Efficiency goes down. In order to make a link turn, you need to flip the arrow in the opposite direction. You want to say, instead, efficiency goes up. Efficiency doesn't go down. Efficiency goes up. And I think that, you know, I think, Zoe, that it's kind of obvious why that kind of thing is offense. So why is it offense if I say that the that the system becomes more efficient if you abolish plea bargaining why what makes that offense it's offense because what you're saying is the world gets better when we abolish plea bargaining so we are saying that under whatever framing exists it's actively better impacts because we 
have the assumption that then like efficiency is good. So if we have, if the, if the negatives already prove that, then that means that so if, if efficiency is good, then that means we are actively creating more efficiency by doing the affirmative. So the negative not only would lose their offense, but you would gain offense because you're proactively proving why you're doing a good thing. Yes, it proves that the resolution is good. Yeah. And is therefore a win condition. Now, um, yeah, that's exactly right. And Zoe, if you could just really quickly tell us what an impact turn is and maybe like the funniest example that you've heard of one. Sure. So an impact turn would be the idea that, well, first I'll just use the example that we're working with because I think it's the easiest way to explain it would just be to say, well, sure, it might be true that plea bargaining is going to create, sorry, abolishing plea bargaining is going to create more inefficiency. But then what you say is, but inefficiency isn't bad, it's actually good. What you're saying is you're taking their impact, which is efficiency or whatever it is, and you're actually turning that and saying what they think is good, it's like a good end state, is actually bad. Um, so a really fun example, I guess it's not that funny, but common impact turns that you might see would be if someone said economic collapse was their impact, right? Mm -hmm. So economic collapse is like assumed to be, then be bad um, because it you know, might create poverty, things like that. So an impact turn would be if the next debater got up and said, actually, no, your scenario that leads to economic collapse is actually great because we love economic collapse. And economic collapse is super good because that would solve our current climate change problems because we wouldn't have industries anymore, you know, polluting the air and ruining the atmosphere with lots of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that turn would be an impact turn because it's saying, well, the ultimate impact of economic collapse at first glance might seem like a bad thing, but actually we want yeah, economic like, like, collapse. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I, 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 I do love that argument a lot. It's basically just the argument that, you know, if we didn't have industries, then we would just all degenerate into hippie drum circles that wouldn't pollute the environment. Exactly. Yeah, you know, tremendous. And the point of the impact turn is that, you know, as ridiculous as they are, and as rare as it is that you get to make them, impact turns are offense. Because your opponent has said that you caused a thing, and you say that it's good that you're able to cause the thing. Or vice versa. But the point is that you basically turn their condition into a win condition for you. So those are the two different kinds of turns and contentions. And those arguments, uh, those arguments are our offense. Um, okay, so let's talk about um oh, so so let's talk about the utility of offense and defense. So um so Lawrence, I have this thing which says, when do you want to use offense defense? And I have this section that's or like, when do you want offense? And I have this section that says not all the time. Um, and you and you wrote some stuff there. Would you mind going over what that means? So uh, I think we've already clarified for why having offense is good because you know you need it to win debates and uh, and if we only have defense then that's bad because the best you can hope for is a tie which I don't really know how that works in debate but uh, if you have too much offense well the problem is is you're not going to have enough defense in these debates and defense is crucial uh, in a lot of these debates uh, because if you only have offense you're just straight up going to lose it doesn't really matter in a basketball game if you have a, an excellent offense that scores you 100 points at the end of the basketball game because you're still going to lose if your defense sucks and they score 101 points right it doesn't really matter uh, that you have excellent offense if they have even better offense so you you have to play defense to your opponent's offense and so you don't want to put offense against everything because if that's the case well not only are you going to get sort of spread thin, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but you're just not going to be able to defend yourself against your opponent's main points of attack, and they're going to be able to win these debates if you don't play defense at all. Uh, yeah, 100% agree. Um, so I want to move on now from offense-defense to kind of the key reason, the key reason that we need um, off, well, that we need an understanding of offense and defense. And really, this is the key reason why we need strategy um, to begin with. And this is, other than offense, defense, this is the most basic strategic concept. So if you understand strategy and you understand offense, defense, 
if you just get one more, just, just one thing from listening to all of our podcasts, it would be the next concept, which is what's called issue selection. Now, um, I guess here's a question for you, for you, Zoe. So when you are, when you are affirmative, let's say you're affirmative and you're trying to give the first affirmative rebuttal. So, um, and you say, oh, Martin and Zoe and Lauren said that strategy is important, but I don't, I don't really care about that. I'm just going to say a bunch of cool stuff that pops into my head and hopefully I win. So um, what's, what's a way that that doesn't go well for you? Yeah, so I think the main thing that would make it not go well would be the fact that then the 2NR can do issue selection. So the idea is in the 1AR, if I make a bunch of random arguments that I think sound fun and cool and you know just extend all of my arguments, the problem is then the 2NR can just decide to go for a couple of arguments but then only then they would only have to answer the argue the answers that I had on those arguments. So the idea is if you have like 10 seconds of an argument on every single issue in the round, the 2 and R could then just spend a whole minute on each of your 10 second arguments, but only go for three things. Mm -hmm. So let's just let's just let's just let's just back up a little bit. So yeah. um so maybe let's just let's so here, here's here's a kind of counter argument uh, from this debater that does that doesn't want to be strategic. Okay. So they'll just say, "Well, there's no problem if I just talk about about a bunch of random stuff because eventually I'll get to the right issues." You know, the idea is that like if I if I if I talk for long enough, I'll hit on some important stuff. So it's not like really important that I know the difference between offense and defense because. If, you know, eventually I'll just run run into the, to the right arguments. You know? oh, okay. Yeah. So um, the problem. So like. So yeah. Obviously, that that like doesn't make sense. But you know, I think it's important to realize why. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the reason why that wouldn't make sense is because first, you don't actually know that you're going to hit the important issues, right? If you're just going down your flow and hitting everything and hoping that eventually you'll hit the most important things, then you could just look at your timer and have ten seconds left and not have hit the important issues. Mm -hmm. And then the next problem with that would be even if you do end up hitting the most important issues in your four minutes of sort of going through everything, you're not going to em emphasize them to the judge. The judge won't know they're the most important issue. And you're probably not gonna spend very much time on them because you've given everything equal credence in the round. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the the most striking thing, and I'm, as we've all experienced, is the look at our timer. Oh no, I have ten seconds left, right? Because the sure. basic idea is that, like, theoretically, right? If you had infinite time, like, if they're just if the universe was just like you had an infinite universe length of time, and you just said a ran like a bunch of random stuff, yeah, eventually you would make important arguments, you know, because you have infinite time. But the one AR does not have infinite time. <laughs> The one AR has a very small amount of time. Yes. Um, it has a mere four minutes. So you have to make decisions about where to spend your time. And as this is especially true for the one AR. Um, Zoe, if you had to give me the percentage of debates where you thought you had enough time to give the one AR, like what would that be? Oh, like <laughs> maybe. Okay, well. In all the debates that I've ever had, probably thirty percent or fewer. Um, it's so high. <laughs> maybe okay. So maybe high. maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe I'm, you're I'm just thinking much, of like you're probably just like much better than me though. Like I'm no, like, I think for that, me that number would. Be that's probably high. not true. I'm thinking about like. No, you're probably every better than Martin. Round. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's certainly true. But... <laughs> I'm thinking about every round, and I guess I was biased toward like senior year when I'd know exactly what to go for in the one AR, but. Which not every round, but sometimes. Uh, but if I think about every round, definitely zero rounds. Probably my first three years of debating, and maybe only fifty percent senior year. So maybe twelve point five percent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. For me, the number is definitely just like two, <laughs> two percent or something. I mean, actually, yeah. yeah. See, senior year was definitely much higher, but like. Yeah, I, I never thought I had enough time. The one AR is so short. And 
if you just like look at the speech on paper, right? So debate has what's called the burden of rejoinder, Lawrence, which as we know, is just that if one side makes an argument, the other side has to respond to it. And if they don't, that argument is assumed to be true because otherwise the judge could decide whatever arguments that they personally agree with more and make really biased decisions and you couldn't control that. So the judges just have to treat those things as being accurate for the purposes of the debate. And so if you just looked at, you know, if you looked at the one end speech, right, the seven minute constructive speech, and you map that up against the one AR, assuming that you're both talking about it at exactly the same rate, you know, how much stuff are you actually going to get through? Uh, four divided by seven, whatever that works out to. Divided by what? Well, like, uh, if your question is, what like percentage of things can you cover? I mean, like four minutes to seven, so not very much. Oh, I Although, would, man, you, you're 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 here with that advanced math. I was just I was hoping you'd be like, oh, seven minus four is three. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, theoretically, there's three minutes of negative stuff that you would that would remain uncovered as a result of uh, the time differential between the two speeches. And based on that, you know, so you have to. So, you know, Zoe, you were you were talking about like extending stuff. The basic idea is that like you can't extend everything, right? If you do that, you would just definitely lose. And yeah, definitely. Then you'd have to extend both six minutes of arguments and respond to seven, which makes it like a 13 force like problem for you, I guess. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, like hu huge problem. You would end up, you know, conceding a large portion of your opponent's arguments. And that's normally not the best way to win <laughs> the, the, the debates is to agree with all your opponent's points. It's not what we want. So the idea is like, you know, as, as useful as it would be to just be able to talk about random stuff and win anyway, right? Instead, most of your speeches are short. So you have to make decisions about how to spend your time. Because if you don't, you will just leave a large portion of your opponent's arguments, you know, unattacked, perhaps. And then that would lead to a situation where you so where where you uh, where you couldn't win now this leads to a very a very basic important concept which is that you, you need to make decisions about how to spend your time aka you need to be strategic so um so i have so we mentioned the concept of issue selection um zoe what is that in in, in the so context of what we just talked about yeah, so issue selection would be choosing to spend your time on the most important things in the round that are necessary for you to win. So yeah, exactly. dealing with the arguments that your opponent has that are the most important for them to win, and then dealing with your own arguments that are most important for you to win. Yeah, that's exactly right. Issue selection. You pick the important points. You can't talk about everything. So you need to figure out what things are important for, for you to address. And I, the word important is exactly right there. Now, Lawrence, going back to what, to what we talked about before and what we've been talking about this, this whole episode, what is – so we know that we want our, our – we know that we want to address the important points. Which points are important and which points are not on balance? Well, it's generally more important that you – answer your opponent's offense versus your opponent's defense, um, all else being equal. Now, sometimes, of course, you, you got to answer your opponent's defense because if their defense goes conceded, well, then you don't have very much offense. But it's very difficult to win if you just concede all of your opponent's offense. So probably want to answer that. Yeah, 100% agree with everything you just said. The things, so you have to make decisions about where to where to spend your time. Now that that uh, you know time choices should be dominated by what's important, and the things that are important are the things that will actually let you win, and only offense can let you win. You can't you can't win on defense by definition, which means that when you are deciding when you're going to give an affirmative rebuttal or when you're giving the second you know the second negative speech. If you have to make decisions about where to spend your time, it is crucial that you identify what points are offense and what points are not. And you can't respond to everything, which means you have to devote some time to deal with a very limited number of points. And when you make those decisions, you need to know which arguments are offense and which arguments are not. 
And what you do is you decide what issues are important and you spend time there and, you know, and not others. Does that make sense to you all? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so that's that's the key thing. If you understand from this episode, strategy, offense, defense, and issue selection, that's probably some of the most important stuff that we'll talk about in the entire, you know, history, history forward looking of our podcast. You know that you have to make decisions about where to spend your time. You can't talk about everything. You can only talk about some stuff. Figure out what stuff is offense and answer it. So, so um, Lawrence, I want to go back to something that you said a, a bit earlier. You were talking about the importance of defense, and your point was that, well, it is important, of course, to respond to defense. Um, because if, you, if your opponent has defense to all of your points, then you obviously can't win. Because if they block all of your shots, then, of course, you can't win. Um, but one, but there is a key difference, Lawrence, between one way to think about it is the quantity of offense you need versus the quantity of, of defense. So let's say your opponent has three defensive responses uh, on each of your three contentions. So if you wanted to win the debate, it's usually not possible to answer all nine of those, right? Yep. How many of them do you need to answer to win the debate? If you wanted, uh, to, if you wanted to figure out uh, what's the least number that you can win, uh, what's the least number of those arguments that you can defeat and still win? Uh, presuming those defensive answers are of some quality, uh, probably just need to beat back three. Uh, honestly, to win. And why? Well, because you don't have to go for every argument that you've made in the original affirmative case. Um, some districts might, uh, you know, have preferences that you do, but on a sort of issue selection level, you don't have to. You only need to win one core argument, which means you only need to win one of your three contentions. So you only, uh, presuming all three of those defensive responses that were made against that contention were good, just need to answer those three. Okay, so you've used these phrase you've used this phrase a bunch of times in the podcast, and I think that um, Zoe, I, I kind of want to ask you about it so that you can kind of clarify th this concept for us. So, what does it mean to say that I have gone for an argument? What does that mean? Yeah, when you go for an argument, I think it's just when you extend it into the next speech, and you. So, I guess it's easier to explain when you don't go for an argument. It's an argument you just stop talking about. Um, you don't you don't mention it in your future speeches at all. So it's an issue that you you know, that's right. It's an issue that you don't select, right? Yeah, <laughs> an issue that you've chosen to invest time or not or not invest time in. Right. Yes. So you go for a point. You make it an issue. You select exactly. it. You know, and um, you go for a point. Now, one important thing that you all have to realize is, so Lawrence, um, what is the difference between insignificance between an argument that you go for and an argument that you don't? Do you mean like literally as in one I spent time talking about and the other I did not? Or as in like the argument that you go for, you should What's the differential the in terms of their ability to affect whether you win? Oh, I mean, if you don't go for an argument, you obviously can't win off that argument right exactly um you know only the things that you talk about in your later speeches are relevant although this is actually not a thing that's obvious to some like you know it less experienced debaters but it's like you know if you brought up a sweet point in your contention one and then just never talk about it again obviously a debate wasn't really had about it which means that a judge can't can't figure out that you're the better debater on the basis of that. So they, they're they stuck with what things you decide to talk about in later speeches. So if you don't select something as an issue, it's just not important. Judges can't think about it. So going for an argument, quote unquote, when you select something as relevant and you, as you said, like sort of mechanically, what you want to do is extend it into the next speech. You take your point and you know, talk about it again. And if you don't do that, obviously there wasn't really a debate that happened about it, so who cares? And a judge can't vote on an argument that you do not select. 
Um, okay, so so you want to have as so um, back to back to the example. So you have to if you if if someone makes three defensive arguments against each of your contentions. Um, here's here's a question for you, Zoe. Why don't you uh, why don't you need to um, answer back all nine of your opponent's defensive arguments, the three on each contention. And to put it in a slightly different way, um, why, how many of your contention arguments do you need to win the debate? Yeah, so you so only need one contention argument to win the debate. Uh, yeah, why? Why, do, why don't you need all three? You presented three points. Yeah, because it's a reason why the resolution is actively good or bad. And once you have that one reason, if that reason becomes the most important issue in the round, back to issue selection, then that reason is all you need to move the ticker and make the judge vote for you. Yeah, exactly right. So Lawrence, if your opponent in basketball, if the, if the opposing team scores zero, or sorry, uh, yeah, they score zero baskets, how many baskets do you need to win? Like four or five any non-zero number will work positive non-zero number i don't yeah. know if you can go negative in basketball though yes yeah uh yeah don't don't get negative points in basketball you heard it here first um but yeah so you just need one point and as zoe said you just need one contention argument you just need one piece of offense so if you want to spend your time one thing that you could do is you could try and answer all nine of your opponent's defensive arguments you'd probably lose, right? Like you're just trying to devote so much time to all this different stuff. If you spread your time that thing, you might win, your opponent might win defense to all your contentions. Um, so, so yeah, now I want to talk about the difference between that situation and offense. Zoe, let's say your opponent, instead of having three defensive responses to all of your contentions, let's say they had three link turns to each of your contentions. How many of those do you need to answer? Then you need to answer all nine of them. You do need to answer all nine of them, exactly. And uh, just conceptually, why is that? Um, it's because otherwise you wouldn't be able to, you certainly wouldn't be able to win at all because then your opponent has nine independent reasons why the resolution is actively good or bad, whatever your side isn't. I forgot which one we were talking about, but um, then your opponent has nine reasons to vote for them proactively, not just reasons to reject your contention. But regardless of what's happening with your contention, these are nine reasons why the judge should win. Like, sorry, the judge should vote for you. So yeah, so theoretically, right, if, you're, if your opponent had three offensive arguments on each of your contentions, let's say they had three, three link turns each, and you disproved eight of those link turns, but then, like, didn't do anything else, so, like, have you won or lost? You've still lost because just like we said, you're, we can, you can just win off of one of your contentions. Your opponent can also just win off one turn. So that's the one point that your opponent needed to score to win the round, and they scored it. Um, if you're talking about basketball again, I guess. Exactly. They they just dunked on you, I think, you know, is the thing that we should say. Lawrence, have you ever dunked on anyone? Yes, surprisingly, but obviously <laughs> not on 10-foot goal, like, you know, one of those kitty goals that are like <laughs> Sir, are you just, are you just playing basketball against small children? Like, what's going on? There have been scenarios in which I've dunked <laughs> on small children. Small kids. <laughs> but also... <laughs> Um, outside my house in Bartlesville, we had a uh, a basketball goal that you could adjust the height of, so anywhere from about five to ten feet tall. And so we sometimes, when we were younger, played had dunking competitions against each other, where we'd move the goal to a height that we could reasonably dunk at. I'm sorry, all of this is just dominated by just me me having a mental image of Lawrence just like dunking on small kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I mean, I may have been a bully when I was younger. Who knows? Oh no, I I don't believe that for a single second. <laughs> um, okay, so so yeah, all you need is that one dunk on your opponent to win, and turn and turns do that. So all this is to say is, it's important when you are debating to do two things. A, it's important to make as many offensive arguments as possible, because 
if you make offensive arguments, your opponent has to answer them. Otherwise, you will win. Because you can talk about those issues later in the debate, and those are reasons to vote for you. You've won reasons to vote for you. You win. That's how that works. So, and then two, it's important to identify which of your opponent's arguments are offense. Because obviously, you need to know which of the things your opponent said that you really need to attack. Okay, so um, is there anything else that you all would like to add to this before we go into our next section, which is kind of like, how to identify offense? What are some common misconceptions about offense versus defense, et cetera? No, I think that's good. Yeah. All right. When when we come back, we'll 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 do some practice on this, and we'll go over some common misconceptions. In the last section, we talked about the importance of figuring out whether an argument is offense or defense. And in this section, we'll talk about how do we actually do that. And I've taught a lot of debaters in, in my day, and a lot of people are easily confused by this part, even though they think that, that they get it. So we're going to spend a decent chunk of time uh, trying, to, trying to get you all in a position where we feel that you are comfortable figuring out just by hearing an argument, whether it's offense or defense. So we have two easy tests to figure out if something is offense or defense. And uh, Lawrence, you you wrote these. So I'd like you to talk about them. Oh, I did write these. Okay. Uh, I think the first and easiest test uh, is to figure out if something is offense or defense is to ask if something has changed. Um, and I think this is a pretty simplistic way of actually figuring out if it's offense or defense, but it, it, I think it's a pretty good heuristic for determining. If something changes, that most likely is offense. As a result of what? Uh, the resolution. So if we were to do the resolution uh, and something changes and the reasoning behind that change, well, that would most likely be offense. So uh, for example, the topic is about plea bargaining and if what would happen if we were to ban it. And so if there's some change from the status quo or how it is now, that is most likely going to be an offensive argument. So if the affirmative says that by banning plea bargaining, we can help alleviate uh, inequities in the justice system, well, that is a change, right, from the status quo, something that has uh, something that has shifted. And that is most likely offense. It's a reason to do the resolution. And if the negative were to say, well, banning plea bargaining would lead to inefficiencies in the criminal justice system, well, that is also a change, and that would likely be offense for the negative. Whereas if nothing changed whatsoever, it's likely defense because you're trying to mitigate the offense that your opponent can get. That's the whole point of defense. So if the affirmative says it would alleviate inequities and the negative's response is, well, it wouldn't do anything about inequities in the system. Well, it's trying to argue that nothing would change. And so it's likely defense because it's a response to an offensive argument the affirmative has made, and it's trying to say that nothing has changed. Uh, I actually really like, I've, I've never heard that before, but that's a really, really good way of thinking about it. If something is just saying that things don't change, then it's probably defense. And if something does change, it's, it's probably offense. Wow, I really like it. Um, and then, Zoe, can you go over this next one with us? This is like, can a judge vote on it? Can you can you kind of just like go through that a little bit? Yeah, so when the judge gives their reasons for decision, usually they're making an argument for like the reason why the resolution is true or false. They're pointing to some argument on their flow that proved why the resolution is true or false. So that argument is usually not going to be something that's defensive because that doesn't actively prove that the resolution is true or false. Um, it's sort of complicated because, you know, judges can be persuaded by lots of different arguments. Mm -hmm. But largely, if you say this is a reason to proactively sign the ballot for me, it's an easy way to tell if it's offense. And if the judge, if it's the kind of thing where you know that when the judge starts their RFD, they'll say, you know, I voted on contention three or I voted on this turn. Things like that are easy benchmarks. Right. Yeah. So at the end of the round, the judge is, is supposed to figure out whose side of the resolution is right. And if that is a thing that they could write down as an answer to that question, it's probably offense. You know, plea bargaining leads to the efficiency of the justice system. It increases its efficiency. 
that's offense because I can imagine someone putting that as an advantage to abolishing plea bargaining versus if someone just said like the, the efficiency did not happen. Now, as you said, though, I'm really happy that you brought up that it's complicated because judges can be persuaded by all different kinds of things. Um, but so which is why issue selection is not just about, you know, whether or not your argument is offense or defense, but it's also about, you know, did you spend time actually persuading your judge that you are right? And there are no easy answers to those questions and because judges are different and debate is hard um, and therefore complicated and great. Um, okay, so those are some those are some some easy ways. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do two other things uh, and then we'll go on to the only important part of our podcast, the outro and mini debate. So so two things. Uh, first is, We've had we've compiled a kind of list of arguments, and we're going to play a game where we where I go through the argument, and then I'll pause and give you some time to think about it. And I want you to think in your head: Is this argument offense or is this argument defense? And uh, you know, we'll like pause to allow you to play along. You know, and if you want, you know, if you're listening, especially with other people, you can pause the podcast and kind of debate it out: Is this argument offense? Is is a defense? And then after the pause, we'll kind of we will go over the right the right answers because there are objectively right answers to this question. So we're going to do that, and then we're going to talk about some drills for for increasing your ability to generate offense. Uh, okay, so we have ten a list of ten arguments here. The first four of them are contentions. So the first contention argument that we have, and the first argument on our list is a contention in an affirmative case. So this says, plea bargaining coerces people, which violates my criterion of protecting autonomy. So I'm gonna, I'm going to pause and I'll give you some time to think about it. Okay, uh, Zoe, um, is this argument offense or defense? It's offense. And why? Because it's an active reason why plea bargaining would be bad, therefore why abolishing plea bargaining is good under their framing, which is about autonomy. So plea bargaining is not a good thing to do if it coerces people under framing of autonomy being important. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Second argument. This is an affirmative, this is a second affirmative contention. This contention says plea bargaining abolition does not lead to inefficiency. Plea bargaining abolition does not lead to inefficiency. Okay, Lawrence, is this argument offense or defense? It's clearly so offensive. No, I'm just kidding. It's it's defense because, um, so using a simple test, um, so for example, does something change? This argument is literally just that the abolition of plea bargaining does not lead to any change in the efficiency of a, of a justice system. So it's not offense. It's not a reason to vote for the abolition of plea bargaining, merely a reason for why you might not outright reject it, um, the abolition of plea bargaining, because of its effects on inefficiency. Mm -hmm. And one important thing that I want to talk about with this thing is that, remember, technically, not all contentions are offense. So you'll notice that I called this argument a contention, but that it is not offense. So one key thing that I want you to recognize is People can fill quote unquote contentions with whatever nonsense they want, including things that aren't offense. And it's important for you to identify which of your opponent's contention arguments you actually need to attack. Because if you never made an argument about efficiency, then as the negative, you would never have to attack this contention. So it's important to sniff out which of your opponent's contentions are offense or defense. And it's important right. just as the app to like, you know, not put these contentions in your app, um, unless you're so incredibly worried about the efficiency argument you thought about dedicating an entire contention to it on this topic that might be plausible but on 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 every other topic no um and okay third argument plea bargaining abolition increases the efficiency of the criminal justice system lawrence well, this is indeed a change because it's arguing that doing the resolution would lead to a positive change. So we should do the resolution. So um, it's offense. Okay, exactly right. That one. That one's kind kind of easy as well. And the final contention one. 
So uh, this is a contention of a negative case. It says plea bargaining is non-coercive, a.k.a. plea bargaining is voluntary. Zoe? So I think this is still defense because it doesn't say that plea bargaining is actively a good thing. It's just that it's voluntary. So it doesn't say that like as compared to the abolition of plea bargaining, there is like a like there's a difference in, I guess, the conditions of how voluntary it is. Yeah, that's right. This argument as presented is not offense. Now, Zoe, if you wanted to make this kind of argument offense, um, there, the, you know, as I'm as I'm sure you know, like th there is an argument on this topic that basically is this negative argument, but in an offensive light. Yeah, there is. So the argument that would make this offensive would be if you made the argument that plea bargaining is giving someone an option and the abolition of plea bargaining is limiting people's ability and freedom to make their like free choices in the criminal justice system. Yes. And so it would be plea bargaining abolition, you know, denies this voluntary action, which is immoral. Yeah, exactly. And it's really important how you'll notice that some some issues, right, can be phrased as offense or defense. So that was an example of an argument that was phrased defensively, where it just says plea bargaining happens to be voluntary. And then that 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 has nothing to do with a change or anything like that. And then the other argument was plea bargaining abolition, you know, is bad because plea bargaining uh, because abolishing plea bargaining removes this voluntary thing. Okay, so now we move on to some of the harder ones where you are where people are making arguments against other things. So the fifth argument, um, X evidence. We're, uh, I'm going to use variables. Sorry for those that, that hate algebra. Okay, so X evidence is so bad. X evidence is so bad. All right, Zoe, is this argument offense or defense? So this argument is defense because it's not a reason why the resolution is true or false actively. It's just a reason why maybe one piece of offense isn't as great as your opponent thought it might have been. That's exactly right. Even though this is phrased really aggressively, right? <laughs> it's, it's phrased aggressively. This evidence is so bad. This evidence is horrendous. I think sometimes people think, oh my gosh, those arguments are offense. They're definitely not. They're just, they're just points about why something your opponent said is maybe wrong. That doesn't, that doesn't make it offense. Okay, next. You actually make X problem worse you actually make X problem worse. Lawrence, offense or defense? This is, in fact, offense. Uh, so this would uh, likely be a link turn, given the phrasing of this, that, um, so say, for example, the... Uh, negative is argued that the affirmative leads to court clog uh and the affirmative is like no i actually alleviate court clog and voting negative would make court clog worse because voting affirmative would make it better sort of thing so this is offense because it's a change um and it's a pointing out why your opponent is bad and why they should lose and why you should win mm -hmm. exactly right okay seven you say i cause x problem but actually i have no effect on X problem. So you say I cause X, but actually I have no effect on X. Zoe, is this argument offense or defense? So this goes back to the does something change test. And so that means it's defense because it's saying you say something changes, but nothing actually changes. So it's not saying that the resolution is creating positive change or whichever side you're on. Yeah, exactly right. You know, I think some people think that when you make offensive arguments, that offense is offense because it proves that something your opponent says is wrong. Right? That's not the test for offense. Offense and defense both prove that your opponent's things that they're saying are wrong. 
This argument proves that your opponent is wrong, but you can't win because of it, so it's not offense. Okay, eight. X thing is bad, not good. X thing is bad, not good. Lawrence? The very definition of an impact turn, which is to claim that you do lead to some sort of change, but that change is in fact, um, well, it's pretty, pretty bad. So an example would be that uh, they say, the affirmative says that, uh, you know, getting rid of plea bargaining or, or abolishing plea bargaining would in fact uh, make the court system have to slow down. Um, and that is good because it prevents us from prosecuting small, low level crimes. And the negative is like, well, you think that's good, but in fact, that's very bad because a functioning court system that runs at high efficiency is necessary for the distribution of justice or something like that. And so they're saying that the affirmative might have, might have caused a change, but that change is very bad. And that is now a reason to not do the resolution. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's right. So nine. So X argument says the opposite of what it was supposed to say. Instead of saying there's certainty about whether something will happen, there's uncertainty about whether it will happen. So I'm going to read that again because it was longer. So their evidence says the opposite of what it was supposed to say. Instead of saying there's uncertainty about whether something will happen, or sorry, instead of saying there's certainty about whether it will happen, in fact, there's uncertainty. Zoe, is this argument offense or defense? So it's still defense because it's not proving anything about the resolution, right? It's about the wording of the card. And largely, if there's uncertainty about whether a good impact will happen, that's not saying a proactively bad impact will happen. It's just saying it's slightly less likely. It's decreasing the probability that their evidence is true, but it's not actually proving that the opposite will happen. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. And this goes to another common misconception. I think people just think that if they reverse what their opponent says, that's offense. Or that you, you turn your opponent's argument by saying that you just prove the opposite of it. That's not true. You know, so, it, you, so this argument is designed to prove that their, their opponent's argument makes a claim. And in fact, you know, the opposite of that claim is true. But that doesn't make your argument offense and it doesn't make it a turn. It's only offense if it leads to certainty in your side of the resolution um, or, and, or not. Okay, the last one, the 10th argument. So you say that I cause X problem, but you actually cause Y different problem, which is bad. So you say, I you say that I cause X problem, but actually you cause Y problem, which is bad. Zoe, is this argument offense or defense? So I think the issue with this is it's technically offense, but it doesn't answer their initial claim. So they still have offense too. Mm -hmm. So it's saying, so you cause, you say I cause X, but you're not refuting that you do actually cause X, right? So you still cause X, but now you do have a separate piece of offense that they cause Y. It's just not related to the initial claim. So for example, if you said, I don't know, uh, the court clog turn, and I said, you say I cause court clog, but actually plea bargaining causes more discrimination in the justice system, which is bad. Like, sure, that's still an offensive argument, right? Plea bargaining creates more discrimination, but that doesn't mean that I don't cause court clog, right? That piece of offense still exists for them. Yeah, that's exactly right. This is offense, but... This would be the classic situation where you would need some defense too. Right? Exactly, yeah. Because you didn't actually, you didn't actually, you didn't really link turn your opponent's argument. You just presented an alternate offensive argument that the judge can look at if they'd like. But you didn't disprove their original argument, so your opponent can still win on that. Which is what, what you know. This goes back to what Lawrence was saying about how it's important to have defense as well. Uh, okay. So before we do some drills on generating opponents uh, on generating offense, Lawrence, you had one 
common misconception about offense versus defense that you wanted to mention. So we should probably do that before we go on. Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, people like to like to say is that offense is attack and defense is defending because, you know, when you carry the sports analogy through, that's the sort of initial conception that people get. And that's why when people are presented with the argument X evidence is so bad, they are inclined to think that that's offense because you're attacking your opponent's case. Um, And this is honestly probably the most common misconception that I've heard at camp. Uh, when, whenever I try to teach this concept of, is that people are like, offense is attacking your opponent's case and defense is defending your uh, your case. Whereas in actuality, it tends to be more of the opposite because offense is when you extend the reasons from your case that you should win and defense is when you defend against your opponent's case to prevent them from winning. So make sure that you don't think of offense as attacking your opponent's case. Otherwise, you're going to sort of misdiagnose what offense and defense is and you're not going to get any of the benefits of issue selection and you're going to end up making mistakes where you do things like say, X evidence is so bad and that's offense. And then the judge is like, what? So you know, make sure that that conception that's that's wrong that goes away uh yep so you can have offense on your case and their case and you can have and you can have defense you know i guess having defense in 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 your case is not really advisable but it is technically possible yeah i i just i I think this misconception comes up from when kids are like giving roadmaps and they're like i'm first going to attack my opponent's case and move on to defend my own and then they extrapolate that to be i'm going to make offense against my opponent's case and then zoe uh did you you know uh, did you like me always found it kind of weird that people kept you keep using the word attack versus defend yeah am i just alone like i don't know like i just felt like that looks always so weird to me like attack their case like what yeah no i i do think it's interesting when people say that because I guess it's just, it's a little aggressive, but it's it's true. I mean, you are attacking their case, but I'm just so used to people saying like answering or responding to you. Oh, gee. Okay. Wait, I'm going to interject quickly. I judged this round at the college, uh, at the flower mound tournament last weekend. And the roadmap was so sassy. The app was like, I'm first going to start by, by addressing the framework, which he has mishandled. And then extend all my contentions that he's dropped and then move on to respond to his bad case. And I was like, yeah, you're getting low speaks for this. This is unnecessarily rude, but I do kind of enjoy it a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. That's pretty funny. I really dislike those those roadmaps. Oh, it was especially, but they're so cheeky. Oh no, yeah, yeah. So I'd have to appreciate them, you know. It, it yeah, was a little long bit bad. Maps are a lot to deal with. Oh yeah, like, I'm, I was, I was like, like, I'm t- like, what's the point? Like I'm still gonna tank your speaks, but like you know. Well yeah, like and especially because he was doing it against um a kid that was like I think in the middle school debate league, and I was like, yeah, that's just mean. Oh no. <laughs> I judged a debate at the Valley tournament where one debater started his two AR with. With with the sentence, like he said, he said the other person's name, which by the way it was always super awkward for me. But like they would be like, like like let's say his name was Ethan. I don't I don't remember it. He would be like he'd be like Ethan. Just because you're fast doesn't mean you're good at debate, right? And then like and then also just proceeded to like lose by a devastatingly large amount. Oh no! Like he just like inserted a random ad hom, right? And then, like, went for a bunch of really bad arguments and just lost easily. And <laughs> at the end of the round, I was like, <laughs> it was like, not only were you unnecessarily rude, you also were just so unbelievably wrong. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, sometimes you, like, hear those things and you're like, well, he's not wrong, but I real, you know, I wish he wasn't, like, so rude about it, you know? Uh-huh. But then, like, other uh, other times it's just like, Wow, you're wrong and rude. You're gonna get low speaks and lose. Wow, worst of all, <laughs> worst of all the worlds. Did people like Zoe when when they when they were debating you? Did they like call you by your first name like a lot? I'm just curious, like, um, like whether that happens. A lot. Yeah. If I knew them for sure. Um. Yeah, it's sort of weird. I think it's also weird as a judge. Yeah, yeah, I I definitely find that find that it's weird. Um sorry, anyway, uh sidetrack. Um so there are two general drills that we have for generating offense. Now, um number 1, this one is kind of easy is you kind of have an argument, you have a case or you have a contention and 
you force people or you force yourself to make a certain number of turns. You force yourself to respond to it, but you give yourself a quota. And at the beginning, you are just kind of going to have to do this. Because a lot of times people are like, like I, I do drills with them and they're like, okay, I want you to make turns. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they give their drill and they're like, one, non-unique, two, no warrant. And I'm like, and then they just like stop. And I'm like, where were the turns? <laughs> like the purpose of this drill was for you to do turns. So identify what the, what that link turn would be. Identify what an impact turn would be and spend some time brainstorming all of the possible ways that can come about. And force yourself to have a certain number of turns before you move on. Otherwise, bad things will ensue. Um, so this th this drill uh, n never gets old. I would do it as as often as you can to where you get to how you're making a certain number of turns. But make sure there's someone there that can like be a kind of like sanity check on what you're doing because you might be like, I'm going to make three turns. And then you're like, one turn, no warrant, which is the second thing that my novices did. You know, they're like one turn. There's no warrant to this argument. And, you know, they're like, I made all the turns. I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> that was not a turn. So um, make sure someone's there to call you on your nonsense and then um, and, and then go ahead. Now, Lawrence, you wrote this last thing here. What is this? Oh, I, it, it wasn't meant to be a different drill, but more of a clarification on on how to do the above drill. Um, I, sorry, that wasn't clear. Uh, so it's. It's about argument mapping, and I find that this is the most efficient way to conduct the above drill, which is to take every argument and to separate each part out into its link and impact, and then identify exactly what is the opposite of each of those things. So, for example, if you have the argument as the negative that the affirmative causes court clog, well, you need to be able to identify the link, which is what the affirmative changes, and the impact as to why that change is bad. And people are really bad about identifying these. And so forcing yourself to write them out in simple link, you know, is X, impact is Y terms, allows it allows debaters to make their link and impact turns a lot easier because now you can explicitly identify what the link is and figure out how to turn it much easier than if you don't think about them two separate. Uh, yeah, okay. A hundred percent agree. If you don't know how, how their argument looks, it's difficult to generate turns uh, turns to it. So, um, and then the very last thing is is just doing rebuttal redos. Um, so you have you have rebuttals. Regiving them over and over again is good. And one drill that I find really helps people with issue selection is practicing, for example, the two AR where you practice giving the 2AR going for multiple different arguments or the 1AR going for multiple different arguments. So remember that the importance of offense and defense is this thing called issue selection. And, you know, the whole thing about issue selection is that it is selection. You make choices. In some rounds, you'll extend your first contention. And in other rounds, you'll extend your second contention. And rarely will you extend both. So it is your job to figure out. And one thing that it's cool to do is just to give drills where you go for one of them versus, and then a different one AR where you go for the other one, just to see what it sounds like. And that can be helpful generally with like figuring out issue selection and stuff. These drills, by the way, as I said before, are important to have someone else there with you because unlike a lot of other things like efficiency, it is pretty easy to get some of the stuff wrong. So you want to have someone there to to correct you. If you if you're like, okay, I'm gonna do this thing, and then you do it, and then someone says, like, well, maybe you you could have done X thing better, then that's really a really helpful criticism. And the last thing I want to say about this is, especially when doing these drills, don't be too hard on yourself. Uh, as Zoe said, debate is super hard, and if it were easy, maybe we wouldn't play very often. So no one masters strategy which means it's your job to try and get better and better as possible. And the whole point of practice is to do just that, which means it's important that, that you learn the right lessons, but also that you don't beat up yourself when you make errors. Uh, okay. So do you all have anything before we move on to the last and only important segment of our podcast? I'm, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good too. All right, great. When we get back, we'll do, we'll do our outro and have a mini debate.
thank you so much for everyone for coming on. Thank you for coming on, Zoe. You've been an excellent guest. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. All right. Let's stick around for, for the mini debate. Two things before then, though. Please um, please look at our SoundCloud page for other episodes that we have. We have a, have a lot of great episodes uh, already. Just one about the plea bargaining topic. If you're interested in getting into that for some February tournaments, if you haven't done it already, um, we have episodes on efficiency, judge adaptation, evidence comparison, weighing, a lot of, uh, you know, giving the perfect 2AR, a lot of really awesome episodes and really awesome content if you haven't listened to us before. And the other thing is to thank again our sponsor, Victory Briefs, for sponsoring this podcast. They're one of the most premier debate camps in the United States. And you all should seriously check them out. Their dates are up and their camps are awesome. All right. The only important segment of our podcast of the mini debate. So um, my, my, the topic for this week that I just now decided is best board game. So like all of our mini debate topics, these are not questions of opinion. They are questions of facts. And they are cold, hard, dripping facts that we all need to come to terms with about which games are good and which games are bad. So for best board game, to, so that you all can think of your answers or jump ship to other answers, I will select Scrabble. I like Scrabble the most. I think it's uh, it's good for you know education and learning lots of different words. You can play it without feeling like you know really angry at people like other games like like Monopoly. It's difficult to invest a lot of you know your own personal self-esteem into it so you can't be crushed when you lose. Um, it's a really fun intergenerational game because young people can play it with with uh, with with older people and uh, plus it has a certain degree of randomness to it, which is which is good. Uh, okay, okay, Lawrence, uh, what is what is your submission for best board game? I'm honestly surprised you didn't pick something like Settlers of Catan, but uh, I'm going to go with Monopoly. Uh, so it's a classic. And I think it's also uh, interesting that the game developed as a criticism of modern capitalist practices, where it was supposed to illustrate how you could start on equal footing, but soon it would result in extreme inequities. Um, uh, that markets would re result in extreme inequities, and that was problematic. And so I think it's a very interesting educational game. It's also got a really nice history. It's up for the link turn, though. Anyway, go on. Uh, wait, wait. Wouldn't the it wouldn't it be the impact turn of capitalism good in that? No, no, no. no. Anyway, go on. Uh, yeah. And how it has like a really cool like eighty year old history. I, I think it um, is like eighty eight years old now. I think. Um, and uh, the way the game sort of became popular actually kind of followed the story of how a monopoly works because there's was like foreclosures, bankruptcies, et cetera, et cetera. I thought that was pretty interesting. And it's, of course, the game that induces the most rage amongst your friends and family that play uh, the game because it's the um, quintessential game for like getting angry and flipping over the board, which is always fun. Uh, all right, Zoe, so you can either uh, vote for one of the two options that, that we've selected and then that just becomes objectively right. Or you can submit a new game, and then we can decide whether we want to jump ship to that. Ooh, I'm going to submit my own game because I actually wrote my college common app essay on oh, this no. game, um, which is Clue. And I, I actually think Clue. Clue is so much fun because you can know it from a very young age. You can play it like on a team with your parents, and it like really brings out like the deductive reasoning, logical side of you, but it also brings out the sort of fun, like mystery fantasy aspect. So I think that it was just something that was like very alluring to me as a child. So I, I have to like stick with it. Hmm. Hmm. I kind of want to jump ship to Clue. Uh, Clue was, was going to be my second choice. Um, yeah. I think Clue is a little bit less frustrating than Scrabble. Less frustrating. <laughs> I have a great, I have a great clue story. So my senior year of high school, I had a birthday party, and I wanted everyone to play Scrabble, or sorry, uh, to to play Clue because it was like one of my favorite games. And I had one friend in particular who was really resistant to to playing Clue. He's like, "No, I don't want to play it. It's boring. Whatever." I finally agree to get him to play to play Clue with us. And for those of you that don't know, the way that the way that the game Clue works is the first uh, when you like go into a room, you um, you like make a guess, and then you basically have to figure out how close your guess is, and you figure out based on it being wrong, 
by you know hidden information from certain players who 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 the killer could eventually be and you know you have a lot of limited information and the the sooner that you figure out who the killer actually is then you win but the important thing for our purposes is that the very first thing that you do in the game is you make a completely blind guess and so this guy who we were playing with, so we were, we, were, we were playing with four of us, so he goes first, gets into a room, makes a blind guess, and that guess is completely right. <laughs> That's really funny. That's such a small chance of that happening. A very, very, very small chance. And it was, it was so awful because I had spent like 40 minutes trying to convince him to play the game. And then he gets it right on the first try, and he's like, "Oh, I guess I win. We don't have to play Clue anymore." And I'm like, "Oh no!" no. <laughs> so I never actually got, got to play Clue because uh, <laughs> he just won on the first turn. <laughs> like this game sucks. <laughs> like, oh no. Uh, Lawrence, any, do you do you have anything to say in your defense, or are you also going to jump ship to Clue, or are you going to maintain that Monopoly is better? I'm jumping ship. Yay. Okay, okay. Th three zero for Clue. Everyone wins, which is almost never how this goes <laughs> i don't think we've ever jumped ship to to a thing before it's always power of persuasion is, is just too good cfl national can i say first seed or whatever <laughs> um uh, okay so very last thing uh zoe the way that we always close out the podcast is by saying stay frosty with like a real emphasis and like drawn out a on stay so would you mind sending off the podcast by saying stay frosty oh my gosh a long drawn out emphasis on the A. Yeah. Okay. Stay frosty. No, oh, this is an argument. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. It's just contradiction. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. It is not. <laughs>